Richard, Professor Richard Richardson has come to Africana as a scholar of African-American literature and also has additional specialties, especially in American literature and Southern studies. She came to us, as you know, many of you know now, she's with us and no stranger anymore. She came from uh, UC Davis, where she was an associate professor. Uh, and at UC Davis, uh, she was awarded uh, with a special citation as a faculty member from the University for Diversity and Principle of Community. Uh, she has a lot of awards that I will just mention a few. Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship at Davis Humanities, uh, among many other uh, fellowships. Uh, her work is published in prestigious journals uh, in her fields, such as American Literature, the Mississippi Quarterly, the Forum for Modern uh, Language Studies, Black Renaissance, uh, Renaissance Noir, and Trans Atlantica. Her first book, which uh, many of you are familiar with, is Black Masculinity in the U.S. South from Uncle Tom uh, to Gangster, that is published by Georgia Press. She herself serves as co-editor with John Smith of the New Southern Studies book series, published also by Georgia Press. Uh, there are so many other things one could mention in terms of her service to our field and profession, but most important for me specifically that uh, Professor Richardson is a talented visual artist whose work has been featured in several uh, museums, uh, including the Rosa Parks, that is the most recent uh, uh, exhibition of her uh, work, uh, Rosa Parks Museum Gallery in Montgomery, Alabama. And her work is also highlighted uh, in a short film made by uh, a Parisian filmmaker, Anne Cremont, I hope I pronounced it right, and uh, Geraldine uh, Schwart. Uh, uh, is it right? I'm on the right track, okay. It's called A Portrait of an Artist or of the artist, and I think this is one of those uh, films that are, 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 are things that are, we have plans to, to show here beside uh, Richard's work. And I want to uh, finally to join me in congratulating her uh, for being included in an article featuring a show that is uh, in, in, in DC, uh, currently uh, running, uh, and featured, uh, featuring of, of, of artwork that is featuring uh, Barack Obama. And it's an exhibition that is curated by Ronald Friedman that included 44 quilts commemorating the presidential inauguration at the Washington DC Historical Society. So if you are in DC, I hope you'll be able to see it. It runs through uh, July 2009. So please uh, join me uh, in welcoming uh, Professor Richard Richardson. Thank you so much for that great introduction. It feels really good to be in this position again, and this time not as a job candidate, but as a faculty member. The South in the United States has been a fecund site of ideological formation, and particularly has served as a wellspring for the generation of ideologies related to gender. In my own work, I've been concerned specifically about how the region has helped to crystallize ideologies that have ultimately undergone nationalization. So my first book project was really invested in looking at how that dynamic works in relation to black masculinity. In my current work, I'm looking at gender again, but this time in relation to the U.S. South's role in nationalizing, and in some cases even globalizing, images and ideologies of femininity. And so I've worked really consistently on this question of the U.S. South in relation to gender as a formation. This current project is part and parcel of a forthcoming anthology on the U.S. South and film. It's a kind of critical project that has been spearheaded by several of my colleagues at the University of Mississippi and represents their interest and commitment really in helping to um, promote a more critical dialogue on the, um, on the phenomenon of film in Southern studies. And so it's really quite an honor to be a part of that project. And that explains why 
I am invested in looking at Gone with the Wind specifically because I want to be sure to provide a more critical discussion of the film in the course of um, a U.S. South anthology on, on that topic. This really is my second paper that I've authored thus far and published on Gone with the Wind as a film. The first one was published a couple of years ago and focused centrally on the racism, what I apprehend as the egregious racism that is interspersed throughout Margaret Mitchell's 1936 novel on which the 1939 film version of Gone with the Wind is, is based. I mean, it is an epic novel, in many ways masterful, you know, I always give it that, but one of the, the, the greatest disappointments of this novel by Mitchell is that it doesn't really engage in a fair or representative um, treatment of black subjectivity. I mean, one wonders, for instance, how could Margaret Mitchell publishing a novel in the 1930s have used terms such as darky to refer to blacks in some cases, or else associated them with this animalistic um, imagery. And yet, these references are suffused throughout the novel and in a very unapologetic way and has done nothing to offset the novel's popularity in some cases. And we have to keep in mind, too, that even though she, from an external perspective, talked about African Americans like this, it's not exactly how they represented themselves. Like you don't hear African American writers in the 1930s referring to themselves as darkies, for instance. And so there's a, there's a kind of failure at self-examination in the case of Margaret Mitchell that I think problematizes the novel and then by extension also problematizes this film. And in terms of its um, representational problems, one thing that I look at in the film and kind of read in relation to the novel is the fact that it's most revered characters have these moments in the novel itself when they engage in these acts of um, incivility toward blackness. That's the only way to put it, really. I mean, in the case of Rhett Butler, for instance, you have him being jailed because he killed a black man on the street in Atlanta for insulting a white woman. So that's the reason that he ends up in jail. And it's conveniently enough a, a kind of reason that is erased once we get to the film version of the novel. And similarly, in the case of Melanie Hamilton, who is referred to by Rhett Butler as being the, the greatest lady that he's ever known, and also the kindest and the sweetest, um, indicates that her rationale, this is in the novel, in, in the novel her rationale for not wanting to move to the North is that her children, or her child at that point really, she only has a son, but would be in the classroom with um, darky children or black children, and she doesn't want him being educated alongside blacks and Yankees. And so even though Me um, Melanie represents a paragon of Southern womanhood, we have to ask how it is that, you know, Rhett Butler even can conserve a positive assessment of her character knowing this kind of thing about her. And my larger point in that particular paper is to underscore that the, the critical assessments and estimations of blackness are somewhat overlooked in the larger critical assessments of the film. So somehow the things that these um, highly revered characters say about blacks become irrelevant in the larger scheme of things in terms of determining the value of the film. And this second paper attempts to kind of extend my dialogue on Gone the Wind, with the Wind a bit in um, new directions. It's a film that's re-entered the headlines in recent times in light of Molly uh, Haskell's new book entitled Frankly My Dear, which was incidentally reviewed by Armand White in the New York Times um, about two weeks ago. And I find it um, to have been a kind of short-sighted review to the extent that it elides the critical interest that the film has garnered, especially in a field, in a field like Southern Studies over the past several decades. But you know that um, review is kind of premised on this liberal reading that suggests that somehow Gone with the Wind has been sidestepped and then lost to criticism and therefore White uh, frames Haskell's project as a kind of recuperative one. And so this review kind of indicates 
where some people are at this point in terms of thinking about and talking about the film. I hope that something like the critical anthology that we're doing will help to take the this dialogues about the film in some new directions. But in general, I also feel that it's important to think about how the US South has worked ideologically in the past, if only to understand its ideological impact in the current era. We must ask these questions, for instance, in light of something like what's going on with a range of Southern governors at this point in their concerted standoff against aspects of President Obama's stimulus package. That we need to, what I want to underscore is that we need to relate some of the antics in the contemporary public sphere back to these larger kinds of ideological Southern contexts that have been generated I'm, the, I'm going to be presenting a version of this paper in Japan in May with um, my colleagues from the University of Mississippi. It's kind of like a showcase panel. We like to do this kind of thing um, sometimes in Southern studies. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And that's another reason that it's very valuable to be able to present it to you here today. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts um, when I conclude this discussion and we'll proceed to the reading of it. Ellen Fine and Sherry Snyder's 1995 runaway bestseller, The Rules, Time-Tested Secrets for Capturing the Heart of Mr. Right, questions and even self-consciously resists the prevailing logic of second wave feminism concerning gender relations and marriage and emphasizes more conventional approaches to dating in order for contemporary women to meet and marry their dream guy. Fine and Schneider argue that career-oriented, take-charge 90s women simply haven't been schooled in the basics, the rules of finding a husband, or at least being very popular with men. While the author suggests their support of feminism, the book implicitly concedes biological differences between male and female genders, including inherent characteristics of masculinity and femininity that scholarship in feminist, gay and lesbian, and queer studies has typically questioned. To achieve the goal of marriage, they offer 35 rules, such as be a creature unlike any other, don't call him, and rarely return his calls, and always end phone calls first. They reveal in the opening pages that their philosophy of dating, courtship, and marriage is inspired by a friend they call Melanie, who assures them that, quote, plain-looking women who followed the rules stood a better chance of being happily married than gorgeous women who didn't. Because of their own proven success with such strategies, they feel motivated to write them down and share them with women everywhere. The authors acknowledge that they became motivated to record and clarify the rules precisely when they realized that this legendary arsenal for succeeding in dating and marriage had crisscrossed the nation and passed among networks of women from New York to California. It is notable that the US South does not register ostensibly in the geography across which the rules are said by the authors to have circulated cross country, particularly when we consider some of the courtship protocols of young white women of the Old South, including those to which Margaret Mitchell alludes in her 1936 epic novel, Gone with the Wind, in describing a custom of declining a marriage proposal three times before accepting. The novel invokes this custom in acknowledging changes that emerged among the Southern elite in marriage in the post-Civil War period. But men in the Civil War who expected to die within a week or a month could not wait a year before they begged to call a girl by her first name, with Miss, of course, preceding it. Nor would they go through the formal and protracted courtships which good manners had prescribed before the war. They were likely to propose in three or four months and girls who knew very well that a lady always refused a gentleman the first three times he proposed rushed headlong to accept the first time." End quote. Indeed, Mitchell's novel's plot itself is set in motion by anxieties related to the topic of marriage, a subtext sustained to the bitter end. In her study entitled Scarlet Sisters, Young Women in the Old South, Anya Jabor provides a detailed historical discussion that examines courtship and engagement among the young white Southern female elite in the antebellum era. As she points out, they were keenly aware of the social responsibilities and expectations that came with marriage. While often rel relishing the attentions that came with courtship and marriage proposals, they were reluctant to rush into engagement and tended to delay marriage as long as possible. Quote, some women subjected their lovers to a series of tests, 
Like the heroines of the double proposal plot, romance novels to which many Southern girls were addicted, young women might initially reject a suitor or call off a wedding only to resume the relationship once they had received assurances of undying love and devotion, which might result in a more egalitarian match. Jabor acknowledges that power in a relationship shifted to the suitor when a young woman accepted a marriage proposal. And so young women valued the power that they could claim during the courtship stage. In her words, quote, when young women yielded their hearts, they relinquished much of their ability to, to, to negotiate for a favorable position in marriage and to resist their subordinate position in Southern society. The exclusion of the US South from Fine and Schneider's rules narrative is something that a popular work such as Lisa Bertignoli's Scarlet's Rules seems to attempt to rectify. Mitchell's ubiquitous character, Scarlett O'Hara, Bert Bertignoli suggests, was an ultimate rules girl. In Bertignoli's words, quote, there's no shortage of women in today's media-saturated world who have captured our collective attention, and fictional and real characters from Carrie Bradshaw to Paris Hilton keep us entertained and amused. Yet, true role models are scarce. For that, we need more than entertainment and amusement. My dear, we need Scarlet. In the areas of media and entertainment, anyone carefully and truthfully watching the David Selznick film made in 1939 and based on Mitchell's novel, Gone with the Wind, might say otherwise. For the film suggests that who we really need is Mammy, revealing in numerous scenes that she is the one who knows such rules best. Indeed, one irony of Gone with the Wind is Mammy's salient role in regulating and monitoring Scarlett's social encounters with men in spite of Mammy's subjection as a slave and servant. Some of the most time-honored scripts and protocols of Southern social life for Scarlett, including rules for getting a husband, are articulated and policed by Mammy. The film Gone with the Wind dramatizes these dialectics in a range of scenes that feature the two characters together. Mammy is the rule model to whom we need to look for a thorough epistemology of the character Scarlett. Vivian Lee epitomized Mitchell's character Scarlett on screen in the film, alongside Clark Gable's portrayal of Rhett Butler and Hattie McDaniel's portrayal of Mammy. Scarlett as a character is provocative and becomes utterly infamous because she repeatedly flouts a range of cherished social conventions in the South and values for which Mammy is positioned as the primary advocate, custodian, and judge. Mammy voices and establishes the laws that Scarlett breaks. Even as Gone with the Wind reveals nostalgia for the Old South and its attendant hierarchical and polarized paternalistic social order grounded in slavery and a widespread view of people from, of African descent as passive, childlike, and inferior to whites in intelligence and through the interplay of through the interplay of Scarlet and Mammy, the film offers a dynamic that unsettles such notions of black inferiority, racial hierarchy, and white supremacy, and racial purity, and illustrates the impact of blackness on some aspects of white racial and social identity. The performative role that Mammy plays in regulating Scarlet's proprieties on the road to an initial marriage and successive marriages becomes all the more complicated if we consider that the exclusion of slaves from um, notions of citizenship and the barriers that prohibited them from legal marriage. Yet the character Mammy's authority in this area is precisely what facilitates her abstraction and lack of subjectivity, a fact emblematized in her namelessness and helps to sustain her relation to the myth of Mammy. As Kimberly Wallace Sanders acknowledges in her study entitled Mammy, A Century of Race, Gender, and Southern Memory, this is a study that came out last year, quote, Mammy is part of the lexicon of antebellum mythology that continues to have a provocative and tenacious hold on the American psyche. Such raced and gendered ideologies of black femininity as Mammy are important and useful context too for understanding how and why some reactionary public dialogues in this nation in recent years have featured black women, prominently and accorded them a motherly and moralizing voice in television and media advertisements that affirm the sanctity of traditional marriage, which have been designed to critique and oppose same-sex marriage, even as virtually no energies in the reactionary sectors that appropriate black female bodies for these purposes have been invested in addressing the kinds of social and economic conditions that have contributed, for instance, to black women being statistically categorized in 2002 by the Center for Disease Control as the least likely women to marry. 
such as position black women to promote social prerogatives and choices in which they are not positioned to share widely, and foreclose discussions of state-based policymaking related to family that might nurture the livelihood of a broader demography beyond the white and middle class sectors tacitly invoked in public dialogues on protecting and promoting marriage. An episode of the popular HBO show Sex and the City which had devoted one of its early episodes to a rules book akin to Fine and Schneider's, alludes to the Old South marriage proposal custom that Mitchell describes when the character Charlotte York attempts to convert to Judaism. With her boyfriend Harry, when her um, boyfriend Harry informs her that it is customary to be turned down three times before being taken seriously as a prospective convert, Charlotte has an epiphany precisely because a rules dating manual has familiarized her with such strategies. Yet, Fine and Snyder never mention such a protocol about marriage in this first book, or for that matter, in any of its sequels. The, rule has had, the Rules has had three sequels thus far, so there are four volumes in all. Um, Sex in the City typically foreclosed the representation of Southern bodies, even as it appropriated discourses and traditions conventionally associated with the region in developing characters such as Charlotte York, who was portrayed by Kristen Davis. Davis was born in Boulder, Colorado, and grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. Many articles and interviews have indicated that she was raised as a Southern belle, and in the media, qualities such as charm, elegance, and refinement have been associated with her and suggested to be an outgrowth of her Southern background. They are the very same qualities of her Sex in the City character. On the other hand, Charlotte is urbanized and scripted as a young, wealthy New York woman who lives on the Upper East Side of the city. With her long conservative hairstyle and classic clothes and shoes, she is a modern day version of Ladies Who Lunch, which seems all the more appropriate because she does lunch so much with her three closest friends, Carrie, Miranda, and Samantha. Oftentimes, Davis's marketing as an actress has emphasized that she can portray such an elegant and refined type of woman on television because she is one in real life. For instance, C, a California-based magazine, describes Davis as a woman, quote unquote, raised with a good dose of Southern Carolina decorum, punning on Davis's home in Southern California and her Southern roots. Indeed, the title of the article, LA Lady, is telling. The pedagogy of womanly behavior and propriety to which she was exposed at, um, and that she internalized while growing up in the South shapes Davis's demeanor on the show to some degree. It is a pedagogy that makes her more reserved sexually and socially than some of the other characters on the show, especially the promiscuous Samantha often implied to be her alter ego. The show portrayed Charlotte as an ex-sorority girl, which evokes the stereotypical association of middle-class women in the South with, with sororities. Furthermore, it consistently portrayed her as the most sentimental of all the women characters about marriage, motherhood, and friendship. A racially conservative Southern tenor in Charlotte's characterization may be subtly evident in the fact that she, unlike Samantha or Miranda, is never featured in an intimate sexual encounter with a black man on the show. Davis's character is implied to be too socially reserved for such a racial crossing, notwithstanding her close friendship with a gay man, marriage to a Jewish man, and adoption of a Chinese baby. Paradoxically, the character Charlotte is not ostensibly associated with the South at all. While we can argue that there is an allusion to a southern city in the south in the name Charlotte, the surname York at a linguistic level crystallizes the association of this character with New York. The, de the decontextualization of Charlotte's femininity from the south in the series reinforces a narrative logic that associates the northeast with the U.S. national subjectivity. Indeed, the erasure of the South and Charlotte's characterization can be interpreted as a symptom of the show's more general strategies of representing the region. Most often, Southerners tended to be portrayed stereotypically on Sex and the City, if at all. In the fifth season, when Carrie and her boyfriend Jack Berger debate whether New York women wear scrunchies as hair accessories, Car Carrie categorizes such accessories as tacky ones that no New York woman would ever wear. One night, she presumes that there might be exceptions when she sees a woman boldly wearing one in a hip restaurant. 
She prepares to make a concession to Berger, but wins the argument hands down when the woman turns around and begins to speak in a southern country drawl, which the show seems to exaggerate for comic effect, and excitedly exclaims to her husband that someone actually thought she was from New York City. Similarly, in the final season, a white couple from North Carolina, coded as working class, even as quote unquote white trash, fails to inform Charlotte and her husband that they have had a change of heart about giving up their baby for adoption. They admit that they held up the pretense so they'd have a chance to visit New York City, the formal setting in which they are presented in the episode is telling too, for the suggestion is that such luxuries are as foreign to them as New York City itself, and it magnifies their poverty, country, background, and awkwardness. Significantly, this action unfolds as the character Carrie Bradshaw explores life in Paris, another major contemporary global city from which such characters, by implication, stand worlds apart. In these instances, Sex in the City seems to highlight such country characters as visitors to New York City to make the city look all the more modern, big, energetic, and overwhelming. In their awkwardness and foreignness, the Southern visitors make New York look like chic and fashion, look like the chic, chic and fashionable place to be and like the ultimate place to visit, though the implication is that always they are not quite fit to endure life there or even fitting to live there. Such characters help to clarify the supreme cultural authority in the nation that the, sh the show associates with the city. It is a city that never even has to be named explicitly in the title of the show because in the US, it is the consummate city. Indeed, the show's New York City setting, like the high fashion clothing for which it is well known, has sometimes been regarded as another character. Over its six year run on HBO, episodes set in places like Los Angeles and Paris also make the point that there's no city on earth like New York City. By bringing four friends together whose bonds and heightened interactions replace conventional bonds associated with family, sex in the city is grounded in the individualist, um, individualism, isolationism, and place, placelessness that govern a host of television reality shows and series such as Lost. There are Southern allusions on Sex and the City that may even be more specific and I want to suggest directly related to the epic film Gone with the Wind. The tenor of the show and its emphasis on sex boldly contrasts with the conservatism and decorum that are often associated with the U.S. South, particularly given the region's persisting traditionalism and prevailing religious conservatism. Yet, if Carrie Bradshaw, as Bird Tegnoli suggests, manifests some of Scarlett's qualities in the contemporary era, then the inexhaustibly wealthy and gallant Big, her tall, dark, on-again, off-again lover throughout the series, has many qualities of Rhett Butler. Carrie's youth and idealism, coupled with Big's maturity and sophistication and their volatile relationship, is resonant in some ways of the continuing angst between Scarlett and Rhett. But the Carrie-Big relationship can be said to reverse the Scarlett-Rhett saga as well. Whereas Scarlett marries twice in Gone with the Wind before marrying Rhett and resolves at the end of the novel that she would ha will have to find a way to get him back, Big is the one who marries another woman on the road to uniting with Carrie, his second wife, um, on, on the road to uniting with Carrie. Ultimately, in the series, he makes a desperate trip to Paris to reclaim Carrie before all is lost. In Gone with the Wind, Rhett admits that he knows Scarlett is the woman for him when he first lays eyes on her at Twelve Oaks. Indeed, in her initial interest in marrying Ashley Wilkes and in her literal marriages to Charles Hamilton and Frank Kennedy prior to the marriage union with Rhett, Scarlett unconsciously revises the Old South rule that Mitchell invokes in, turns, in, in turning a man down three times. All of the four main characters on the series of white women and minority women are entirely absent within this nexus of primary characters, a structure premised on the idea of cross-racial friendships between women as, um, as non-normative and, and unrealistic, and the racial separation, even segregation, of white women from ethnic and minority women in private and social, i.e. non-work settings. The all-white cast of the show's major female characters reinforces the notion of a pure and monolithic white identity. In the antebellum era, in the context of slavery, legal prohibitions against slaves marrying reflected a lack of black citizenship and were premised on notions of black inhumanity and the categorization of blacks as property. Contemporary popular representations that exclude or marginalize blacks reinforce ideologies of blackness as pathological and socially inferior. Furthermore, such representations ideologically suggest that minority women are alien from matters of love, romance, marriage, and family, and conflate such concerns with whiteness. 
And I, I go on in this discussion, like one article that comes up for me, for instance, is one that came out back in 2006 um, by a woman named um, Joyce Jones who quotes a, a child in a, in a class, um, I think this is a sixth grader, that she um, encountered who said that marriage is for white people, as if somehow it's totally unrelated to blackness. There's a section that follows up in this particular paper where I talk about this idea of America's sweetheart that is familiar in cultural and popular domains. And it's a notion that's oftentimes associated with the most prominent actresses. Like, for instance, um, Julia Roberts and Reese Witherspoon are illustrations of actresses who are oftentimes regarded as American sweetheart. This is um, Reese Witherspoon in, in, in this um, image. I am interested, however, with the ways in which this idea, this ideology really of America's sweetheart is explicitly related to Southern actresses. And I think that there's a reason for that. And one it goes back to early cinematic um, foundations established in films such as Birth of a Nation. This is a film, for instance, in which Lillian Gish acted. She wasn't technically a Southerner, but I suggest in my work helped to establish foundations for how the U.S. South has oftentimes been feminized in the American cultural imagination and then also associated with the ultimate prototype of femininity. The rationale of Birth of a Nation as a film, to a great extent, is that it's important for um, reunification between the South and the, the North to occur at a national level and also um, for the protection of womanhood, bias narrative um, coded as white. And so all of those uh, foundations in American cinematic history, I suggest in my work, established and expanded a certain ideological terrain that to an extent continues to shape female representations in the popular sphere. And so there's a section entitled From the Old South to New Hollywood and American Sweethearts that I um, go over that also sets the foundation for a following section entitled What Southern Bells Have to Do with the Red Carpet that I'm going to share with you now. In content, Gone with the Wind epitomized the elaborate costuming techniques that distinguished the classic era of Hollywood filmmaking. I want to suggest that the Old South, so masterfully recuperated in its costuming aesthetics, may have some residual traces among Hollywood actresses in the contemporary era. Southern belles of the antebellum era, who were the product of vast wealth and privilege generated in relation to the South's plantation economy, were primarily mythologized through their association with a rarefied beauty and femininity that were quintessentially symbolized in the elaborate and colorful gowns they wore trimmed with lace and ribbons and that were made from expensive and often imported fabrics. Even in popular context, such attire seems indispensable for their visual representation, which is typically contextualized in the plantation as a space. And Gone with the Wind, lavish sets that showcase plantation homes such as Twelve Oaks and Tara, particularly in the opening scenes, a wash with Southern Bells and Southern Gentlemen, and the casting of established stars such as, such as Clark Gable and Vivian Lee to embody such types brought the mythic Old South and the glamour of Hollywood together. In the defining representations of the Old South, um, if the defining representations of the Old South were popularized in plantation literature that emerged in the late 19th century, film gave us the defining images of Old South mythology in the 20th century. And no film did that more decisively than Gone with the Wind. Indeed, like forms of feminine iconicity in the nation and through films such as Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind, the U.S. South is one early context that helped to popularize and nationalize Hollywood as an industry and arguably as an ideology. A most classic and memorable image from the film Gone with the Wind is that of the character Mammy corseting Scarlett and helping her get into one of her many fancy and colorful gowns in preparation for the barbecue at Twelve Oaks Plantation. Mammy's assistance in Scarlet's dressing rituals and protocols reflected the notions of aristocracy in the Old South. In thinking about whatever happened to the Old South with its bells and balls, body servants, and elaborate dress protocols, we might look to contemporary Hollywood and aspects of its star system related to the fashioning and pampered lifestyles of its most revered female actresses. There seem to be some traces of the pampering associated with the Old South's favorable southern bells in the styling of such contemporary Hollywood actresses. 
labor on the part of stylists, designers, personal assistants, trainers, hairstylists, makeup artists, and jewelers is necessary to prepare starlets for a walk down the red carpet and an evening at award ceremonies such as the Academy Awards, the Golden Globes, the Emmys, and the Screen Actors Guild. Actresses must consult with designers to select the dress before a major event, be meticulously fitted and suited with the proper undergarments, shoes, and accessories, including jewel jewels worth thousands and sometimes millions of dollars, which are often borrowed. It takes tremendous wealth, of course, to sustain such lifestyles and this range of goods and services. This wealth has come for some leading actresses with the rise of a few who now make millions of dollars per film and from heart won and from a hard-won right to demand higher salaries on par with those of top leading male actresses, I mean actors in the industry. The money that film stars amass reflects the vast wealth and influence of Hollywood in this nation, and for that matter, in the world. Like the purported 3% of women in the world who can afford to wear designers made to order couture fashions, Hollywood women are part of a socially elite and highly privileged class of women in society who have access to the best products of fashion design. There is intense competition among top designers to dress the most beautiful and popular women in Hollywood who are often the best advertisements for their work while walking down the red carpet. Given the fascination with Hollywood, actresses can often give couture designs more media exposure than models on fashion runways. And I'm not suggesting that I agree with that, because I don't. I mean, I feel that you know one needs to be true and fair to certain trades. And there's a problem, for instance, when Hollywood actresses typically nowadays are featured on the cover of Vogue even more oftentimes than people who've actually paid the dues in, say, the fashion industry for those kinds of spots. Hollywood actresses wear the world's best design and most expensive dresses and rank among the most pampered and revered models of femininity in society. The protocols of their fashioning in the contemporary era recalls the protocols that helped to fashion the Southern Belle for social events in the South and that structured Southern social life. By the late 20th century, imagining classic Hollywood nostalgically was in some ways akin to the representation of the Old South in the late 19th century as an ideal time gone by. Such cont continuities perhaps make it seem quite fitting. In retrospect, that a, filming, that a filmic feast such as Gone with the Wind, which was released at the very end of the 1930s, recast feminine dress conventions of the Old South at the height of an era of Hollywood glamour. It can be instructive when contemporary Hollywood stars are also linked to a classic notion of Hollywood. One of the most iconic examples of recent years is Gwyneth Paltrow's pink dress and upswept hairdo on the runway the night she won the Academy Award for her performance in Shakespeare in Love in 1999. For many, her look recalled the style of the legendary actress who became a princess, um, who became a princess uh, Grace Kelly. Some contemporary actors and actresses see old Hollywood as a primary reference point and seek to reinvent or recall it in their fashioning on the red carpet. My point here, however, is that in having access to vast wealth and privilege and invitations and, and dressing to attend such exclusive social events, such actresses often from the site of their expense expansive mansions recall the intricate stylization of Southern Bells from Southern plantations in U.S. history. Was Scarlet Black? In How Black Was Rhett Butler, Joel Williamson discusses factors such as a darker skin color and a loose and attitudes about sex and work to examine Mitchell's character Rhett Butler's complex racial significations in Mitchell's novel, which were ultimately immortalized by Clark Gable. Similarly, Diane Roberts considers the racial aspects of Scarlet in the myth of Aunt Jemima by emphasizing Mammy's role in reinforcing Scarlet's whiteness and the novel's profuse red imagery, including Scarlet's name, that links her with a physical hyper-embodiment, transgression, and sexuality in the process of examining the question, how white is Scarlet? Shelley Fisher Fishkin's Was Huck Black advances such critical methodologies by arguing that a black boy that Mark Twain encountered in a Chicago hotel and chronicled in a piece entitled Social Bull Jimmy provided the linguistic energies for the title character in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, so often identified as the quintessential American novel. 
In Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination, Toni Morrison widened the critical space for thinking about how much blackness, whether or not it is acknowledged, has shaped narration in literary works in the American canon. Such questions were examined within the critical and theoretical context of post-structuralism that stressed anti-essentialism and emphasized race as a social construct with no inherent biological basis. In the Selznick film that builds on Mitchell's novel, it is noteworthy that many of the social protocols that Mammy attempts to enforce for Scarlett are specifically related to the issue of marriage. Such a theme, alongside marriage itself, is one of the key legal and linguistic frameworks for enacting the performative and the legal ramifications of Mammy's status as a slave, further reveal her agency in Scarlett's fashioning as a woman and has the potential to deepen our understanding of Scarlett's racial instability as a character. Margaret Mitchell Scarlett, the product of an Irish father and French descendant mother, is presented as an ethnic hybrid. Her volatile personality is suggested in some ways to be a result of this admixture, notwithstanding her mother's mild manner, elegance, and grace. In her 2001 novel, The Wind Done Gone, Alice Randall plays on Scarlett's complex family background in Mitchell's novel. Randall's provocative revision of Gone with the Wind, whose publication was suspended as a result of recriminations by the Mitchell estate in the months before its publication, casts Scarlett as a character who is not only of mixed ethnicity, but also scripts her as uh, mixed race. A purloined letter of sorts holds the evidence that Ellen Robillard had black blood, which would of necessity mean that her children, by the conventional rules of hypodescent, inherited this racial status from her as a mother. Revising the Scarlet story so that she has inherited black ancestry in her family tree is truly provocative. This strategy makes Scarlet an unlikely bedfellow with a character such as William Faulkner's Quentin Compson, who, for instance, Ben Relton compellingly compares to Rhett Butler or even Joe Christmas. On screen, the film Gone with the Wind thoroughly embodies the linguistic energies that the novel associates with the character Mammy. The force of the character, as many critics have pointed out, owes a great deal to Hattie McDaniel herself as an actress. In his now classic study of blacks in Hollywood, Donald Bogle notes that Hattie McDaniel's, quote, Mammy, also feels confident enough to express anger toward her masters. She berates and hounds anyone who goes against her conception of right and wrong, whether it be Mrs. O'Hara or Scarlet and Rhett. Not once does she bite her tongue. Bogle goes on, goes on to say that Mammy, quote, becomes an all-seeing, all-hearing, all-knowing commentator and observer. She remarks, she annotates, she makes a size, she always opinionizes. As Bogle suggests, Mammy stands above the other characters and does not hesitate to judge them, a point of view of which Rhett is keenly aware when he identifies her as, quote, one of the few people whose respect I'd like to have. The opening scene of the film, along with some other characters, highlights Mammy sanctioning Scarlet about flouting aspects of, Southern, of, of social decorum. Mammy is concerned that Scarlet has gone out without a shawl in the night air and failed to invite the Tarletons for dinner as a proper girl would. Indeed, her appearance in the opening scene of the film and her forceful speaking helped to establish Mammy's authority. The camera shot of Mammy from below and the framing of her face and upper body in an upstairs window of Tara make her look even more authoritative. And I want to pause right now and play just a brief clip from the film. So. Now, do I just press play here? This is with the input. Okay. There. There. Yeah. Okay. Now press play. Switch up the, the DVD below here. Well. Right here? Okay. Oh, it's got me in the house. You suppose you said something to me, man? Let's go! Wait for us to go! I have to say it! Get out! 
Thank you. <laughs> okay. Recurrently in the film, from this opening scene, Mammy likens Scarlett's behavior to that of a range of people who are the latter's social inferiors to underscore this character's lack of propriety. In the opening scene, for instance, Mammy rebukes Scarlett by telling her that, quote, you ain't got no more manners than a field hand. The immediate cut to Tara's field hands as Scarlett runs off to investigate Ashley's intentions to marry Melanie Hamilton in a pastoral scene as the sun sets and this quitting time dramatizes this contrast. In associating Scarlett with the crude and masculine behavior of field hands, Mammy highlights her behavior as the most extreme contradiction of the delicacy and femininity befitting the proper young wealthy white woman in the South. Such analogies, which ironically recall ways in which white women in the 19th century were often likened to slaves, affect a symbolic blackening of Scarlett in the film. More generally, they can also be understood in relation to the film's release during the years of the Great Depression. As Marion J. Morton points out, quote, Scarlett returns to Tara to find her mother dead, her sisters ill, her father insane, and the plantation in ruins. Scarlett works literally like a slave, even picking cotton, when, which the servants refuse to do, and learns to do for herself what others used to do for her. Gerald O'Hara, later chiding um, his daughter for making a spectacle of herself running after a man when she might have any of the bows in the county, reinforces the criticism of Scarlett's lack of propriety that Mammy begins. Later on, Mammy's criticism of Ellen O'Hara by serving as a wet nurse to the, I mean, by serving as, um, as a nurse to the poor white Amy Slatterly, in effect extends the link of a lack of proper decorum as a Southern woman to Scarlett's mother. Ellen O'Hara first appears in the film as she returns from the birth of Jonas Wilkerson and Amy Slatterly's out of wet lock stillborn child. Amy, the obverse of Scarlett and her sister Sue Ellen and Kareen, is a girl that Gerald O'Hara ostensibly classifies as white trash. It is significant that the opening scenes of the film emphasize notions of Southern propriety and stress the proper protocols and boundaries for the Southern elite. The close sequential timing on the same day of all of Mammy's quips and chides related to proper behavior for Southern girls and ladies and their repetitions emphasize her role as a gatekeeper of such values. Moreover, in the early and now classic and familiar scene that features Mammy tightening Scarlett's corset prior to the picnic at Twelve Oaks, a ritual that recurs later in the film once Scarlett marries Rhett, Mammy continues her rebukes of Scarlett, warning her that she can't wear the dress she prefers because, quote, you can't show your bosom before three o'clock. When Scarlett refuses food that has been brought to her and expresses her intention to Mammy to eat at the picnic, Mammy replies that, quote, you can always tell a lady by the way she eats in front of people like a bird. Again, Mammy likens Scarlett eating habits to a field hand. Scarlett tells Mammy that Ashley Wilkes, whose family is hosting the barbecue, says that he likes a girl with a healthy ap appetite. But Mammy wins the argument with Scarlett, forcing her to accept her tray and eat at home by pointing out that, quote, what a gentleman says they likes and what they does are two different things, and by reminding her that Ashley had not asked her hand in marriage. The scene implies the adherence to protocols of Southern social female decorum to be designed mainly for getting a husband, a ritual to which Mammy is far more attuned than Scarlett. This is a point confirmed in Scarlett's question, why does a girl have to be so silly to catch a husband? The content of their dialogue initiates one of the film's reigning themes related to marriage and needs to be heeded, I want to suggest, for the ways in which it continues to reinforce Mammy's subversion of her own legal subordination as a slave and for how it begins to establish her voice and authority on this topic, which the film reinforces and intensifies as it continues. For instance, when she chides Scarlett about the impropriety of going to Atlanta to intrude on the relationship of Mellie and Ashley, or later when she restrains Scarlett from interrupting this couple's reunion when Ashley returns home from the war. He's her husband. Here, while the emphasis is on Scarlett, we see more generally how vigilantly Mammy guards the reputation of the O'Hara family. It is ironic that Mammy cares more about the O'Hara name as a, as a slave and regards herself as a custodian of his repu reputation, exclaiming to Scarlett that, quote, if you don't care what folks says about this family, I does. As Scarlett leaves, Mammy warns her to take her shawl to protect her skin from developing freckles, skin to which Mammy had applied buttermilk all winter. Mammy's sanctioning continues at the barbecue, where she reminds Scarlett that, quote, well-brought-up young ladies take snaps at parties and that she and her sisters should act like Ellen O'Hara's daughters, not the children of poor whites. 
The film presents the opulent Twelve Oaks Plantation even more so than Tara as the emblem of the Old South's wealth where the paternalism of the slave system is fully and fairly actualized. Through the eyes of the characters Melly and Ashley, it appears on screen in all of its glory as a beautiful and peaceful world that is in every way ideal. The Civil War is the greatest and most immediate threat to the sanctity of this place. Yet, the sign at Twelve Oaks on which the camera zones in as Scarlett and her sisters arrive at the plantation, which says anyone disturbing the peace on this plantation will be prosecuted, teases viewers with the idea that Scarlett represents this most immediate threat. Her indiscriminate flirting with bows at the barbecue her refusal to take a nap, her clandestine pursuit of Ashley, her breaking a vase, and her harsh words to Rhett attest to the truth in this. In this setting, the knowledge that Rhett Butler took a girl out with a chaperone in the late afternoon without a chaperone in the late afternoon and refused and refused to marry her is scandalous information that points to his lack of social decorum. But the film makes it clear that Scarlett is not too far behind him. Rhett's question to her, has the war started after she throws the vase in anger, seems to play on and revise Abraham Lincoln's legendary reference to Harriet Beecher Stowe as the little woman who started the big war in light of the impact of her 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Indeed, the negotiation and procurement of marriage is a dimension that gives the film thematic coherence and continuity from the very beginning. This is evident in the pronouncement at the opening of the film of Ashley and Melly's betrothal, Ashley's lecture to Scarlett on what makes a successful marriage, the connection of Mammy's rebukes to Scarlett to the protocols of getting a husband, Scarlett's serial marriages to, to Charles Hamilton, Frank Kennedy and Rhett Butler, and in Rhett's final rejection. Costuming is used effectively at the barbecue, particularly for women, to create a festive atmosphere and to emphasize the lavish lifestyles and luxuries associated with the Old South. It also sets up a subtle contrast if we notice the, juxtap the juxtaposition of bright colored gowns of Scarlet and some of the other younger women with Melly's more reserved attire. That Scarlet overhears other bells talking about her and remarking that, quote, men may flirt with girls like that, but they don't marry them. And the encounter with Ashley and his imminent marriage to Melly prompt her to marry Charles Hamilton hastily. Scarlett is loathed by other women with the exception of Melly. As the film continues, the marriage theme is sustained as Melly and Scarlett are juxtaposed as wives, mainly through the eyes of Rhett Butler as a character who regards the former as a great lady. His acts of reclaiming Melly's wedding ring after she had made a donation of it to support the war cause um, because it will do my husband more good off my finger and returning Scarlett's ring as an afterthought dramatize the distinctions that he makes between them as women in his mind. We should remember that Scarlett's failure to be a proper wife and then widow or to respect the marriage of Ashley and Melly is at the heart of the scorn heaped upon her, including Mammy's criticism. Mammy chides Scarlett about failing to honor mourning attire and unlike Ellen O'Hara, is aware of Scarlett's true motives for going to Atlanta to see the Hamiltons to await Ashley when he comes home on furlough from the war. As wise and perceptive, Mammy puts it, Scarlett will be sitting there waiting for him just like a spider. And then I talk a bit about the, the colorful scene of um, the Atlanta ball, this fundraiser during the war effort. Um, I just want to just say something brief about it here. This colorful scene extends the film's metaphorical connections between Scarlet and slaves. This time, however, the analogy is more feminine than masculine. We must remember that um, slave women were most frequently purchased on the auction block, sometimes for the express purpose of sexual exploitation. Here I'm referring to the scene where Rhett Butler bids $150 in order to be able to dance with Scarlett during the Virginia Rail. What does it mean that he basically buys her in the way that one would purchase a slave on the auction block? So again, there's a kind of um, mythology that's being sustained there between Scarlett and the notion of the slave. And then more broadly, one can argue that Scarlett is also in some ways linked to prostitution in the film because you know, you have Rhett's relationship with Belle Watling on the one hand, and then Scarlett going to get um, $300 for him when he's in jail to pay $300 to pay the taxes at Tara. So not only are these analogies made in the novel between Scarlett and slaves on the one hand, but then also between prostitution. So for her, it just gets worse and worse. And Mammy is there to support her in, um, in off offsetting this abjection to a certain extent. Throughout the film, Mammy turns the most critical eye on both Scarlett and Rhett as characters and sees their behavior as inappropriate and excessive. 
Her scathing, her scathing estimation of the both of them is epitomized in her assessment of their marriage and their effort to dress up and hobnob among the elite in New Orleans by describing them as attempting to dress up like racehorses when they are really mules in horse harness. In essence, this is another allusion to the slave class, for Mammy accuses them of attempting to do a cakewalk in reverse by pretending to have the refinement and pedigree of the elite. Mammy's reference to horses is particularly significant here. She is ultimately commenting on their failure to manifest the social behavior in keeping with the breeding that they have had in the Old South. It is also a term that links them to racial instability if we remember that the word, quote unquote, mulatto, an epithet, is um, an epithet whose etymology is unclear, is sometimes linked to the mule, a hybrid of the horse and donkey. Though she is black and their subordinate, Mammy is the best custodian of the Old South's values and protocols in the film. From the time that, from the time that he returns, wait a minute, I'm confusing something. Indeed, when he and Scarlett are taking Bonnie for a ride in her buggy, a ride on which Red Hat insisted to, to remedy their position as social outsiders, it is significant that the camera remains on them. They are the focus in this scene, and we see none of the neighbors to whom they speak strolling down the sidewalk. Such a technique emphasizes their behavior as performance and as awkward, ill-fitting, and as an awkward, ill-fitting one, and that even makes it seem in some ways that they are on stage. That the character is not given a name and is simply described as Mammy in Gone with the Wind suggests her invisibility and subjection as a slave, a subjection that persists once she became a free servant. Hattie McDaniel famously remarked that I can be a maid for $7 a week or I can play a maid for $700 a week, which was in part a response to the black civil rights establishment that expressed concerns about perpetuating stereotypes on screen in, in such subservient roles. Jill Watts, who has written a masterful biography of McDaniel, remarks that she, quote, that she not only was commonly accorded screen credit, her name was increasingly identified with black cinematic female servants. Watts observes that McDaniel, who had read the novel and become fascinated with the role of Mammy, reinterpreted the character, built upon her past experience in acting, and constructed the character that she portrays in the film, in effect breaking new cinematic ground. Even so, McDaniel separated herself from the servant characters that she portrayed. This perspective clarifies her acumen as an actress and her actions on screen as a performer. As a performance. Watts helps us to understand that in portraying characters who were either mammies or maids in films throughout the 1930s, the appearance in Gone with the Wind, while distinctive, was the outgrowth of a very complex journey for McDaniel as an actress. In a time when Jim Crow governed the Southern social order, that the actress McDaniel was not allowed to attend the premiere of the film in Atlanta, Georgia, was a poignant illustration of the way in which her subordination in some of her roles on screen was manifested in life. There's a brief scene in uh, the novel Gone with the Wind, to just point back to that briefly, that I think uh, accords a similar agency to black masculinity that I also deal with briefly in this discussion, and that is in the character of Uncle Peter. Like in the Hamilton household, similarly to how Mammy operates authoritatively at Tara, there's a, a character named Uncle Peter who really makes a lot of the key decisions for the characters, Melly and her brother, Charles Hamilton. Like Uncle Peter, for instance, we come to um, see in, in the novel, um, makes the decision for Charles to go to Harvard. He decides when it's appropriate for um, Melly to, to marry. In um, a context where their Aunt Pity Pat, who's really their guardian, provides very ineffective gu uh, guidance, Mammy, I mean, Uncle Peter kind of steps in and takes the reins in terms of leadership in the family. So that a black man makes all the decisions in the Hamilton household is very significant and provocative on some levels. And yet, in the film version of Gone with the Wind, we get a basically comical Uncle Peter. You know, he's kind of portrayed as this chicken chaser, and, and that's just it. And so it's, it's just unsettling in, in certain ways how the film Gone with the Wind unsettles the agency that the novel does indeed accord to Uncle Peter. Okay, to move toward the conclusion. The plump body form and an intimate association with food of the mammy had been established as a spectacle in American film. For instance, the mammy in the inaugural film epic film Birth of a Nation helped to establish foundations for this type's typically stereotypical representations on screen. The emphasis on the body was a signpost of the mammy figure's powerlessness and underscored her vulnerability and accessibility. In Gone with the Wind, mammy comes across as wise, disrupting, and challenging um, Western philosophy's classic association of rationality with the disembodied white masculinity. After Melly, 
um, we need to remember that Rhett Butler cares most about what Mammy thinks of him. Notwithstanding her racial subordination, like Melly, Mammy sets a very high standard in determining what and who is respectable. When it comes to other blacks and when it comes to Scarlett, and even to Rhett to an extent, Mammy is the boss, so to speak. And I just want to, as a kind of brief aside, uh, show you a quilt that I made featuring Hattie McDaniel, or it's, it's a quilt really that attempts to revise and rethink the image of McDaniel presented in the film Gone with the Wind. The title of this piece is uh, Playing a Mammy, Not Hattie McDaniel, to underscore the distance between um, McDaniel's film roles and then her own identity that McDaniel emphasized. I mean, McDaniel often gave lavish parties at her Hollywood home, and she conducted a salon, really, for black actors of the time. And so one thing that I do in this particular uh, piece is to let some of the hair show to underscore that the kind of glamour that was associated with McDaniel was in some ways repressed in the film itself. You know, McDaniel was known to be a, a nice dresser and to be a very stylish woman. And so while she wasn't portrayed as one of the screen sirens of, of Hollywood, you know, how might it have been if her true stylistic energies had been allowed to come front and center. She in no way identified with the images that were associated with her in the media and even used her weight as an accessory, I think. So this is just one image that I, I've um, constructed to kind of question some of the levels on which she's been associated with stereotype. To conclude, the popularity of servant figures like Mammy on screen, of course, must be understood as a nostalgic pan to a traditional domestic culture that was collapsing during the Great Depression and by the 1940s with the beginning of World War II and the entry of more white women into the workforce. Even with the end of World War II, the circulation of items featuring Mammy figures in U.S. material culture signaled nostalgia for a time gone by. And Gone with the Wind, though she is not the feminine ideal sanction in the Old South, Mammy comes across as the wiser in attempting to tutor Scarlett in the art of femininity. Scarlett's emergence as a pillar of strength in the film, who ultimately vows that she will never go hungry again, marks her coming of age and traumatizing by the war and the ruptures temporally and geographically that have defined her identity. Yet the factor that seems to retain that seems to remain most stable for Scarlett in the film is Mammy's circumscription and shadowing of her behavior and social comportment. It is a shadowing so profound that it, is, that, it, that it is more enduring and pronounced, perhaps, than the impact of either of Scarlett's parents. Incidentally, Alice Randall's aforementioned novel, The Wind Done Gone, seems perceptive and subversive in describing Scarlett as Mammy's child and reveals that Mammy deliberately taught Scarlett how to manipulate men and hurt them as a way of avenging her servitude. In the film, the scene in Atlanta, when Scarlett attempts to seduce the unwitting Frank Kennedy and lure him away from her sister Sue Ellen, poignantly illustrates such dialectics. It is an impropriety about which Mammy remains silent and fails to try at Scarlet. By the film's narrative, we must also remember that Mammy, in effect, designed and sold the lavish green dress that Scarlet is wearing at the time. Scarlet lives the very life and has the possessions, such as beautiful dresses, that Southern racism will not allow Mammy, making the noticeably erotic gift that Mammy receives from Rhett, a red taffeta petticoat, all the more provocative. Mammy was more in control than Scarlett ever knew, or for that matter, anybody around them. Yet, domestic authority to sanction the propriety of marriage is not the same as having the privilege oneself. Hence, in some ways, that the decontextualized Mammy is given salience as the guardian and gatekeeper of the social prerogative of conjugal union legally reserved for whites in the antebellum era to a degree emphasized her own subordination and exclusion from such privileges. Her exclusion and dissociation from notions of femininity was an unspoken premise of revered types such as the Southern Belle, who eventually grew into the lady in the South. After all, there is not much use in knowing the rules if one cannot play and win the game. Thank you so much.
entertain questions, comments that you might have. Yes, Mark. Uh, Rache, I wonder what you, what your opinion is of the fact that when Hattie McDaniel was up for the uh, Best Supporting Actress, she was competing with Olivia de Havilland, who played Melanie, mm -hmm. and she won. And so um, I'm wondering if your response to the, to the idea that a lot of people, because she won by the vote, like I said, uh, might have seen a lot of what you're saying in uh, Mammy's role, that she was in some ways kind of the glue uh, of the whole romantic aspect of, of uh, Scarlett's uh, position. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, definitely. I think that the, the fact that she won clarifies her value as an actress at the time and the agency that came forth. I mean, if we think about it, McDaniel's appearance in Gone with the Wind was very episodic. You know, we see her at the very beginning and then once Scarlett goes to Atlanta, she disappears virtually until the second half of the film. We don't see her until really the setting is Tara once again. And yet and still, you know, in spite of a kind of marginal appearance in the film, McDaniel takes over and dominates as a character is telling of how she marshaled her own talents as an actress to not only make a contribution here, but then in some ways to redefine the role that one would ordinarily associate with a more subservient figure. So yes, I, I do feel that her, um, her prioritization in this award um, ceremony is something that we have to pay attention to. And you know, what does it mean Historically, we certainly must continue to act, ask that you know she was the first African American to ever win an Academy Award, and yet, and still, the horrific, horrific downside of that is that she wasn't allowed to attend the premiere. And out of this kind of pandering to Southern racism, you know, the idea that they might be affronted in some way if she were allowed to come in, and so that did a lot to unsettle the power. Um, you know, the Jill Watts biography of McDaniels includes some useful information. One thing that one walks away with, and I think appreciates to a certain extent, is the level to which Rhett, um, the, the character, um, I mean, uh, Clark Gable, who portrayed the character Rhett Butler, was genuinely a friend of McDaniel. You know, he would oftentimes go to the parties at her home. And so I think that they had the best kind of cross-racial friendship that society at that time would enable and allow. And so to kind of read the narrative of that friendship is really inspiring. And I think that to a certain extent, her relationships with the characters like um, de Havilland and um, Lee were more distant. But I, I really don't know um, what de Havilland's reaction to this award was. I think it's, it's kind of unsettling, though, that in more recent years, de, Havilland's, um, de Havilland was used as, as a way to re-glorify the film and notions of the Old South and a kind of celebration that was had for her in the past decade. Certainly she was talented, but you know, do we need to, to reassert the primacy of the Old South myth to, to validate her work as an actress? Right. I think that. Yeah, the, the challenge in, in doing the piece was to kind of conserve the authenticity of the time in certain ways, but to show these subtle um, subversions that were there in McDaniel. So the hair is important, like the, inf the earrings kind of really come across too. So, you know, to, to kind of show that even though she was in this conventional Southern attire, she also um, had these decorative qualities associated with her that we could easily overlook. And so the art piece, in a way, attempts to magnify and emphasize them. The piece itself uses, like there's a dishcloth that, that serves as the backdrop for, which is, which is very different really from any other quilt that I've ever made. Like the materials are 100% cotton and then 
the, um, the buttons are made out of whalebone, and this is also the only quilt that's stuffed in a way to indicate McDaniel's weight, again, as a kind of feature and accessory that she used subtly. And it's also significant that, well, it's the kind of companion piece for a Gone with the Wind series that I have that kind of inaugurates an old Hollywood series in, in my own quilt repertoire. So there's a companion quilt, quilt of scarlet that accompanies this and that features scarlet in the prayer dress that we see, the white prayer dress that we see at the beginning of the film. So in this, in these particular pieces, she and McDaniel's image are, are wearing the same brooch. And so there's a kind of continuity implied. Um, the quilt of scarlet is bigger, but I think that in certain ways, McDaniel like, make, makes a statement in and of herself. So the question becomes how to enter that historical moment and yet instill in some ways question the, the kinds of romances that are often associated with it. So that's what the purpose of that quilt series is designed for, like to, to kind of play on some of that. You have her with lipstick on? McDaniel? McDaniel? Yeah. yeah. Is that a statement as well? Well, I think that one of my general goals was to, to highlight McDaniel's beauty and femininity, a beauty and femininity that are oftentimes obscured in readings of this film. Like, the, I think that for a long time I've been fascinated with, and talking one of my um, essays in a footnote about this, I've been fascinated with this almost erotic scene that occurs with the Rhett character and Mac, the McDaniel character in the film, where um, this is on, on the, I mean, at, at the character Bonnie's birth, and, and Rhett is so ecstatic as he's about to become a father, and Mammy's mood has kind of lightened up a bit because she does not like him and makes that clear for a long time in the film. It's, it's kind of unsettling that actually what seems to win her over finally is Rhett's money, that she sees the lavish estate in Atlanta and sees what his material wealth provides. And so this kind of, in some ways, reshapes her perception of him. But in that scene where he offers her a drink and then as she's walking away, he hears her petticoats rustling and asks her if he can see you know, like lift the petticoat so I can see. I mean, there's, there's a kind of sexual agency that is embodied in the McDaniel character that is so unlike that associated with the conventional mammy figure, who's oftentimes presented as asexual and who's oftentimes presented as someone who nurtures and adores white children more and her white charges more so than her own children. And these are dimensions that come out fully that fully erupt in the novel by Alice Randall, The Wind Done Gone, where you get a mammy who's actually engaging in a sexual relationship with Gerald O'Hara because of the perceived even sexual incapacity of his wife and who's actually had um, children fathered by him. And so this is not the erotic kind of portrayal. I mean, this erotic portrayal even in, in um, Randall's novel is certainly kind of more obscured and gone with the wind, but what I think is fascinating is that it is there. And so I think that in a way, my, my artwork is designed to kind of let some of those sexual energies play as well, at least as best they can. Yes? And actually, in, in reality, uh, there were a lot of sexual relationships between the mammy and the master. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not, it's not all that far-fetched to, mm -hmm. to, to do that, and the idea of the Mammy being this asexual figure is something that was created by slaveholders. Okay. And I think that it's something that has been perpetuated in even certain academic understandings of the plantation myth. It's really excellent points there. Any questions, observations? But in, on the literature side, the argument is that many of the mammies didn't look like that. that that's that image of the bigger woman. Um, not so much. I, I like the way that Kimberly Wallace Sanders deals with that notion, though, by looking at representations of the mammy figure in American material culture to underscore their diversity. You know, that while we have this kind of image of a certain type in the American 
cultural and arguably academic imagination, the truth is that there was widespread diversity in terms of how the, the mammy looked. You know, they were people of all complexions, all sizes, a lot of diversity and range. And it is important to think about how this ideology of domesticity, as it gained even a kind of scientific credibility from the late 19th century on through the 20th century, helped to crystallize in the American cultural imagination this certain type, this ideology that you know, continues to um, abide with us. And I think it's an imprisoning ideology to a certain extent. Um, I feel ambivalent, for instance, about a lot of the analogies that are oftentimes made between um, Oprah Winfrey, for instance, and, and this kind of type as if one cannot conceivably be empathetic without um, being associated with this, this history, really bearing its weight. Um, to what extent are caring and concerned the, the kinds of feminine, well, you know, we have debates about that too, but it's as if one can't show those qualities without necessarily being thought of as, as a kind of party to ideology. Internationally? Yes, somebody Could just you? brought me ten from Turkey. It's the same headdress. Oh, okay. And then, of course, of course, the South. Uh, I know your work looks at the South in relation to the Caribbean, so I thought that'd be an interesting observation as well, because from New Orleans down, you see it in the tourism images as well, if you buy tourist art. They all have that. This is a most important point that you're making. Not only um, from a theoretical standpoint, like for instance, a lot of times nowadays um, in Southern studies, we've been talking about the, this idea of the global South and looking at the notion of a plantation complex and particularly these, these post-plantation economies. Um, I have colleagues who published an anthology a few years ago at Duke University Press entitled Look Away, the U.S. South and New World Studies. And one thing that it does is to emphasize the importance of looking at the South as a region from a more hemispheric perspective and through a post-colonial lens. So instead of reinforcing these ideas of American exceptionalism, one thing that the anthology encourages is that we think of the U.S. South as a kind of North in relation to the Caribbean, to see how its plantation economies have continuity with the, the plantation economies of the Caribbean and South America. You know, how do, we, how do we see, say, a novel like um, William Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom differently if we look at the cadre of slaves um, for Sut Penn's Hundred th that um, was, was purchased in Haiti? You know, these are the kinds of linkages that this particular scholarship would encourage. I, I think that these analogies are important to point out, too. Um, one thing that I did a few years ago was to to look at the phenomenon, the brief phenomenon in culture of Miss Cleo, this um, infomercial character really that became so prominent at a certain point. And the, or, the story of her origin is very similar to the origin story of Aunt Jemima, where you know, like two white men in the late 19th century were basically responsible for developing Aunt Jemima as a logo and that eventually became a trademark and has really been the longest running trademark in U.S. history, um, beginning with its emergence in 1889. And so what did it mean that exactly 110 years later, I asked, two white male Florida entrepreneurs were basically the ones who hatched this idea of, Aunt, of, of Miss Cleo and having her speak in a kind of Caribbean patois and fabricate even, well, the, the accusation was eventually that she fabricated Caribbean origins, and then also they marketed a range of products in relation to her. So one, one thing that I, I really stress there is that the U.S., the way in which the U.S. has kind of negotiated a type like Aunt Jemima opened the space for this, and why blame, say, the woman who portrayed Miss Cleo when there's a larger kind of ideological economy that produced this problematic in the first place. So. The, the style, this idea of the fashioning of the body and you know, certain continuities, I think, are definitely important to illustrate. But then there's also the question of whether we can presume that the, the strategies of costuming, say, in other geographical contexts necessarily carry the ideological weight that 
one would associate with them in the U United States because you know headscarves are also important African accessories and and, and so somehow this pejorative um, kind of they've been associated more with a more pejorative connotation in the United States um, but yeah I, I think that this is is a, is a very good observation well, there's some refreshments outside I'd like to continue talking to the President.